Okay, um, we're going to get started today. We have three speakers, so we have a lot to fit in. And um, before I introduce Dorothy, obviously we're going we're gonna to keep uh, with, we, you know, we really like this uh, continual back and forth of questions. But since we do have three speakers, unless it's, you know, serious clarification, try to keep it in, in, in bounds. Um, anyway, so it's a, it's a pleasure. I'm, I'm going to give you another one of my fabulous, as John calls my fabulous detailed introductions of the speaker. Um, I, I've never met Dorothy, um, but I've read a lot of her work. And this is going to be something really different. I think you're going to enjo enjoy it. She's at the University of Georgia. And Dorothy does field work in non-human primates and capuchins. And they're, they're smart little critters. And they engage in, in natural tool use and complicated tool use in the wild. So there are other species that have independently evolved a re relatively um, sophisticated tool use. Uh, what's that? I'm going to talk about that. Yeah, and <laughs> this is what she's going to talk about. She also brought some props, which she's we're going to pass them around so you can actually see some of the, the nuts and how hard they are that they have to crack. So um, tugging at tool use, Dorothy Fergazi, thank you so much for coming. Yeah. <coughs> is this on? Yes. You can hear me? OK, yeah, I don't need this one. All right, thanks, thanks so much for the invitation to come. I really appreciate it. I've been learning a lot, and, uh, and I'm really impressed with the sort of scope and, and organization of, of this summer school. And it's been a pleasure to meet you all. And I look forward, I'm serious, I look forward to the questions. Um, it's going to be, I don't normally address a group like this. I'm normally talking to ethologists and psychologists. And so you, you have expertise that I don't even dream about. So um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking to you about these things. Because this is something I really like to talk about. Um, let me, let's see, did this turn off? All right. So um, this is a, a talk that is about tool use, but not exclusively about tool use. Um, psychologists have been thinking about tool use in non-human species for a very long time, dating back more than 100 years. And you're probably familiar with uh, Wolfgang Kohler's uh, studies um, that he did actually during the First World War. He had the good fortune to be stuck on the island of Tenerife off the coast of Africa throughout the entire First World War and conducted uh, studies with captive chimpanzees there. And he was interested in problem solving. He was actually a gestalt psychologist. And he was interested in how animals formulated solutions to, to the problems they faced. Um, <clears throat> in the middle of the 20th century, Jane Goodall began field work uh, in Africa with wild chimpanzees. And she was the first scientist to report that chimpanzees use tools in the wild. And when she reported this to Louis Leakey, who was sponsoring her work, he commented, now we must redefine tool, redefine man, or accept chimpanzees as humans. Well, this is a little bit of an overstatement because we'd known for a very long time by then that non-human animals did use tools, but, he, but we didn't know about it in apes. So this group is an interface group, a multidisciplinary group focusing on brains and artificial systems and how to put them together. And so thinking about this from the outside, I think of myself as an outsider to this group a little bit, it, it seems to me that your, your task is to seek the right information in novel situations. That is, if you are building a tool user, a robotic tool user, it has to seek information in the right places in novel situations. It's a sort of open-ended system. Then it has to organize actions with objects, in, with sequence and with spatiotemporal relations. And then it has, to mo it has to somehow keep track of, of outcome. It has to modulate action under and performance under dynamic conditions. So in the end, it, perhaps it can become skillful. I, I think of that as organismically, that's what you want. You want to become skillful. And I think this is sort of the ways that one gets there. So an ethological approach to this interface, that is at the, at the behavioral organismic level, this is what I can do. I investigate tool use and its precursors in a range of species and settings. And, and some of my subjects do too. Whoops. Oh, no. I hit the wrong thing. Well, I just want to point out my cameraman there on the stool. <laughs> um, so then after that, we can identify essential attributes of tool use by seeing what is common across species and situations. And then at that point, I pass that information to an engineer because I have no idea how to, how to um, design a robot. So first, I want to talk about tool use. 
um, tool use does not have a singular evolutionary history function, ontogeny, or mechanism. It is not, from an ethological point of view, a unitary phenomenon at all. There is no biological theory of tool use, how or why it appeared, its ontogeny or its function, because it's not a, a, a simple unitary phenomenon. And from that, from that perspective, we can't yet make well-articulated claims about the cognitive requirements for tool use as a generic category of, of activity. After all, we, we see tool use across a very wide range of taxa, including invertebrates. Um, and it's, it's hard to say exactly what's common in all these cases. This is because tool use is defined descriptively as opposed to theoretically or in terms of some logical premise. And, um, <clears throat> and definitions vary across authors. And if you go to the literature and look up definitions of tool use, they've been changing since 1898. You know, I mean, it's, it's, there's many definitions of tool use. All right, so I'm going to give you my definition of tool use, is that an animal uses a tool when it uses an object as a functional extension of its body. You can read this, to act on another object or surface. And the point here is that there must be, the tool user must produce a spatial or force relation between the tool and another object or a surface. And this, this definition, like all others, is, is um, not so different from uh, its precursors, but it, the uh, emphasis on producing the spatial or the force relation is um, the part that, that um, I want to focus on, because um, most people studying tool use in non-human animals, at least in non-human primates, um, start from an interest in reasoning, in whether the animal using the tool understands the causal relations involved in the problem, if they're anticipating the solution when they begin the action because of some reasoning process. That's a psychological orientation. But I'm not coming from that orientation. I'm not concerned directly with whether they're reasoning about the spatial relations involved. And in I'm interested in what spatial relations and force relations they are producing and how they come to, to do those actions and not some others. So it's, um, it's, a, it's my own orientation. Okay, so today what I want to do is first talk a little bit about tool use and manual function in primates to give you an idea of what, what we see and how the animals are using their hands in these actions. And then I want to talk about spatial problem solving in the lab um, where I have actually spent more of my career doing laboratory experiments, and then talk about tool use in the wild and how animals in the wild learn how to use tools. So um, starting with tool use in primates and what are the primates, we've seen a lot of, of uh, taxonomic, they're called a cladogram, where you see this sort of an image. Um, and uh, showing the different branches of the primates and sometimes even more than that in John's talk. Um, this is a, a fairly recent cladogram uh, done from molecular phylogeny. And what I want to point out is the number of species. This shows 186 species. The IUCN specialist group actually recognizes more than 500 species. That's about three times as many as are shown on this graph. We keep discovering new species every few years. The number of species of primates that recognized by taxonomists has gone up by about, I don't know exactly how many, I think it's something like 70 species since 2000, and the numbers are still increasing. And this is particularly the case as we roam around in the forests of Madagascar and discover that there are many more mouse lemurs than anyone ever imagined, uh, for example, but we're discovering new species all over the place. And I also want you to note, often in the cladograms that are interested in showing human relations to other primates, that you show a branch for the, the prosimians, and it's, it's a single branch. And you show a branch for the New World monkeys and a branch for the Old World monkeys, and it's like a straight line. And you get the idea that there's been no speciation in those groups since they diverged from the common ancestor, which is absolutely not true. And I want you to notice the number of branches in this tree, and this is a little this is only a little snapshot. It's, it's about one-third of what there is. Um, and uh, the, one of the smaller groups, the tarsiers are the smallest, and then the apes are the next smallest. 
And the new world monkeys and the old world monkeys, there are many, many species. That was the point. And the other point is that there are 30% of the species recognized by the IUCN are recognized as endangered or critically endangered. And we have had extinctions of species in this century, known extinctions. So I urge you all to remember that, that primates are endangered. And whatever you can do in support of preventing further extinctions, thank you. You can't be a primatologist and not also be a conservationist. All right, so <clears throat> hand tools. I'm really talking about hand tools. There are many other ways to define tools that don't involve producing a direct physical force relation, but I'm talking about hand tools, objects that we're holding in our hand and doing something with. And this is really a signature aspect of human behavior. And I just put up a couple of samples here that are kind of routine things that we don't think of as particularly complicated, but I can tell you that they are a lot more complicated than what we see non-human primates do. Other species of primates do use hand tools in the wild sometimes. You see a much greater diversity in captivity, but those are very hard to interpret from a, from a biological point of view because you, you often don't know what sort of training has happened. And you can train animals to do a whole variety of things that they don't do spontaneously. It doesn't tell you too much about the natural origins and the natural ontogeny of these behaviors. So the four cases of populations of non-human primates that are well documented to use tools rather routinely in a natural habitat include the bearded capuchin, the common chimpanzee, the orangutan, and Burmese macaques. And these come from New World monkeys, apes, and Old World monkeys. We don't yet have a case of a wild prosimian using a tool, but I, you know, I'm waiting. It might happen. So um, these species all use percussive tool use, which involves ha hammering or puncturing or scraping, where you're applying direct physical force between the object and a surface or, or another object. And there are some other forms that are seen periodically, <coughs> excuse me, sponging or raking, or sometimes using a container, um, a few different forms. But percussive tool use is a, is a relatively common form. Probing is also a common form. Okay, so they, so, yes. So, so the, you're saying that of the 500 recognized species, about 1% uses tools. Correct. Okay. Yeah, even less than 1%. Yeah. Now, within, so it depends on how you count, um, because in, this, in the genus of, in capuchins, the, in the tufted, so it's, now called, it's now a separate genus called Sapaju. So the genus Cebus has recently been split into two. The Cebus are the gracile forms from uh, Central America and Northern South America. And the tufted forms are the Eastern and Southern forms. And that includes now something like eight species, if I'm not wrong. And of those eight, at least three have been shown in the wild to use tools. So three kinds of capuchins. So my, my, my slide for bearded capuchins is a little bit overstating the case. Yeah, There's a few other sapaju species. Just for clarification, well. you're saying it is rare. Among these it, 500, it's Extremely rare. rare. Okay. Extremely rare. Yeah. Routinely. I'm talking about routine yeah. tool use. That is that you see individuals in the population doing it, and you come back tomorrow and you see it again. OK. Yeah, thanks. <coughs> Yeah, I apologize that I may cough sometimes. I've still got an airplane throat. Sorry about that. Um, all right. So the forms of tool use that we see is using an object to produce a change in a substrate or a fixed object. It's a really relatively simply. And more rarely, they use one object to alter another loose object. And that's the case in cracking a nut, because you have the nut, and you have to put the nut on a surface, and then you have to strike it with a stone. So these are examples of non-human primates doing exactly that. Um, they may also use a tool kit. That is, they use two or more items in sequence for different goals. This has been described in chimpanzees and in bearded capuchins. <coughs> and in this case, uh, this is a, a chimpanzee hammering a um, bee's nest and then extracting something from it with a smaller stick. So they don't use as many kinds of hand tools as humans do. So they don't move two objects concurrently in two hands, as we do when we use a knife and fork. They don't use tools that require precise alignment of a feature with another feature. For example, a screwdriver, where you have to take the head of the screwdriver and 
place it in the slot of the screw. Uh, that's, they don't do things like that spontaneously. They don't use tools that require complex visual motor transformations. For example, when you use a fishing pole and you throw out the hook and then you're fiddling around, you're moving the tip of the fishing pole to control the hook at the end of a, of a, of a, a, a line, a, a string or nylon line. And so that's a, that kind of uh, multi, that has too many degrees of freedom for a non-human primate to manage without training. I'm not saying that you couldn't train animals to do these things, but these are not things that they would do spontaneously. So, and it's also true that tool use is not critical to the survival of any non-human primate that we know about. These are always uh, actions that are in support of something, some aspect of quality of life, but they are not critical to their survival. And in every species that we know of that, that has tool use, um, there are populations that don't have any, and it's, they're still there, they're doing fine. So it's not a requirement for survival, which you can't say about humans, because all human cultures that we've ever encountered have tools in one form or another. So people have talked a lot about what they might use as a metric of complexity in tool use in non-human primates. There is no consensus. There's several uh, alternatives. They all catch something essential about tool use. And uh, since we don't have a clear theoretical definition of tool use, we're never going to arrive at any clear consensus about exactly what you should measure to determine complexity. So people have looked at the sequences of actions, how many actions. They've looked at the total number the hierarchical organization of those actions and the people who are interested in linking tool use to language are, are especially interested in this one. Um, they've looked at selection and transport of materials. Archaeologists and physical anthropologists are especially interested in this one because they're trying to interpret sites that they encounter and they find tool materials from somewhere far away and they want to know something about how far they've been transported and how many different individuals transported materials. And did they first nap the stone and then bring it somewhere? Or did they bring the stone somewhere and then nap the stone? So they're very interested in selection and transport. Um, and then there is the number and nature of spatial relations. And I'm coming from, from that um, orientation. But there, there are others. And if you get into the literature, you'll find lots of different ways of, of talking about this. If you think about all those things, though, and then you look at this picture again, you can see that all these characteristics of, of hand tool use that are very common in humans. None of those that are in this image would you expect to find in a non-human primate. None of them. Not that you couldn't train them, although I'm really not sure that you could train a monkey to use the knitting needle and yarn. I, I, I think that would be beyond them, really and truly. Okay, so now let's talk about hands. So primates have hands. All primates have hands. Other creatures don't have Hands, they have paws or hooves or something, but not <coughs> hands. Hands belong to primates. This is a primate-centric view. And sometimes people that work with possums or other creatures or raccoons, they sometimes, in the literature, you can see them described as hands. Mm, I, I think they're not hands <laughs> because hands don't have webbing between the digits. And they have, all primate hands have a high density of tactile receptors in the in the uh, ends of the digits and in the palm, also on the feet, but we're not talking about feet. Um, and they have, and primates as a whole have uh, good eye-hand coordination, which in, 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 uh, is uh, usually explained as a part of the whole uh, constellation of characteristics that allow primates early on, the earliest primates, to uh, take food from hand to mouth, as opposed to putting the mouth directly to it, which is something that John mentioned in the very very first day. Okay, <clears throat> so this is a primate tree with showing you just shapes of hands. There is a, quite a bit of variability, especially in the direction of the thumb and the lengths of the digits, and sometimes one digit is particularly short, as for example, if I can make the pointer work here. I'm a little hot. Yeah, okay. So notice here we have a sort of vestigial uh, first index finger here too. Um, so the spider monkeys and colobus monkeys, they've completely lost the thumb. They just have four digits and they just have a sort of a nubby spot where the thumb would be. Um, so there, there is variation in primate hands. But all primates can grasp objects in the hand, at, at least with a power grip with the fingers converging together. Let's see. 
Um, now, when you get to um, monkeys, especially old world monkeys, you see a whole lot of variety of different forms of, of hand postures when they're holding something, including something that we recognize as a precision grip. And there's an example here um, where the thumb comes into contact with the other digits. And it, there are also other forms of precision grips, like when you hold a, a pencil between two fingers. That's also a precision grip. It means a precision grip is defined as being able to move the object in the hand without um, moving the whole arm. So if you can fiddle the thing around in your hand without um, involving um, the, the, the wrist and the elbow, you've got a precision grip. So um, something that is very uh, characteristic of the precision grip in, in humans and in all old world primates um, that have a thumb is um, what we call a pinch grip, which is the index finger to thumb uh, and the, the pulp of the two fingers coming together like this. And all catarrhine primates, which includes old world monkeys, humans, and humans and, and apes, um, can do this. They have a saddle joint which allows you to rotate the thumb like this. Neural primates and prosimians don't have a joint like that. Some of the prosimians have some other joints that are interesting, but I don't have time to talk about that. Um, but in general, uh, neural primates do not produce a pinch grip like this. But the capuchin monkeys, and as far as we now know, only the capuchin monkeys can produce a functional precision grip, but it's from the thumb to the side of the second digit. And this implies that they have a certain amount of independent control of the digits because they're not just bringing the hands convergent, the fingers convergently together. They are somehow opposing one finger to the other. So they have some degree of digital control, in individuated digital control. Um, and here's an example uh, of a capuchin monkey in the wild using an index finger uh, it alone. And they, they can uh, use the index finger like this, another, another example of uh, at least some degree of individuated finger control. They don't use a precision grip in all the same situations that an old world monkey does, and it seems to be more effortful for them than it is for an old world monkey, but they certainly have a functional precision grip despite not having a saddle joint. Yes? that have that individuated finger digit control? I can't think of any. I don't want to make a blanket statement that there aren't any, but I am not thinking of any offhand. I'll keep thinking about it. All right, so humans uh, use a large variety of in-hand movements, and by this I mean exactly what is shown here, for example, precision handling of small objects in the hand so you can flip a pencil without it even touching your palm. Um, and there are many uh, craft activities that humans do that involve uh, this kind of, of uh, delicate movement of objects within the hand. Um, we've looked to see whether other species do movements like this. And we've looked in chimpanzees and capuchins. So we've really only looked in two species. And chimpanzees do <coughs> use some of them. Chimps have relatively long digits except for the thumb, which compared to human thumb is, is very short. Um, so they wind up doing um, moving objects around uh, between digits two, three, four, and five, and then every now and then pushing something with the thumb. But the thumb, unless they are doing a pinch kind of grip, the thumb is um, it's, it's very short. If you took the human thumb and sort of knocked off the, the terminal bit of it, you, you might have something approaching the, the length of the, of the chimp's thumb. But they do use some in-hand movements. And other species we don't know. We've looked in capuchins, and we've, we've um, given them the same kind of problem that we gave to the apes, which was a pass-through problem to orient a shape to a panel to pass it through. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, we, we didn't see this kind of hand movement in, um, in our capuchins. So perhaps there's another preparation that we could use that would elicit it, but it isn't something that they do readily, I can say that. And other species we don't know. Someone needs to look at this for old world monkeys. Leah. <coughs> OK, so non-human primates primarily use power grips, not precision grips, and not in-hand movements when they're using tools. They're using a stick that they're holding in some kind of a power grip 
or if it's something like a grass stem when chimpanzees are, are fishing for termites, for example, they may kind of lay it between uh, digits two and three and across the palm or something like that. So it it's something that may have uh, some component of a precision grip, but it's basically they're holding on to the whole object to have a firm grip on it. They're not doing these fine motions within the hand. Um, and this slide depicts various um, pounding actions by Burmese macaques um, and the, the stones that they're using to do it, all of which involve some kind of a power grip to hang on to it because it's, the stone is relatively large. Okay, <clears throat> so now I want to talk about sp solving spatial problems in the lab, which includes tool use but is not exclusively about tool use. <coughs> and then I'm really going to gallop through this. So um, there, I, I, I'm going to ask you to hold your questions about, about these studies um, to when we have a, a bit of time because I really want to get to the stuff about the tool use in the wild and I'm afraid if we take too much time I won't get there. So um, <clears throat> first to give you some background about capuchin monkeys, they have several unusual features uh, for New World monkeys. They live a very long time, they're relatively small bodied and adult is about two to four kilos in, in the wild, um, sometimes a little bit larger, certainly sometimes larger in the lab. Um, <clears throat> but a lifespan of, of, of somewhere over 50 years is extremely unusual for a small-bodied non-human primate. And they have a correspondingly slow lifespan, a life history with a long juvenescence and so forth. They have large brains in relation to their body size, a proportionally large neocortex. And I've already told you they have a high degree of manual dexterity. <clears throat> in this slide, the capuchin is here, slightly above the line, and the um, apes fall more or less along the line. So if you wanted to brag, which sometimes I do, um, you could say <laughs> that capuchins are relatively more encephalized, if you like, than the apes. Um, <clears throat> so these monkeys are distinctive for their extractive foraging. They rely on physically tough foods, seeds and encased invertebrates. They rip things out of the ground, out of wood. They, they bang open <coughs> tough fruits and extract the seeds or the pulp. They have extremely thick tooth enamel, very robust jaws, very robust crania, and very robust musculature in the upper body that goes along with being tough. They are really tough. Um, <coughs> and in their natural foraging, Percussion is a routine activity. They frequently take some sort of hard fruit and they are whacking it. Um, and they have a prehensile tail. And I have to tell you, I profoundly regret not having a prehensile tail because it enables such freedom of movement that you, you can't imagine. They're beautiful to watch. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now I'm going to summarize just in a list the kinds of spatial problems that monkeys in the lab can solve. Um, they can nest seriated cups, the same kind that we give to our children to play with. And after they've made a seriated set of cups, if you give them a cup that fits into the middle, they can disassemble the, the set and put that one in. These are um, uh, uh, play toys and tasks that have, have, in developmental psychology, have a long history of being used to investigate children's cognitive development. Yeah? How much training can they do? Pardon? How many cups? they do I mean can they um, do it right away do they have to practice it for a while it's, it's feedback, right away or? they're not I didn't say they were efficient at it I said they could do it and the way so um, the way we did it is we we trained this as a pass back routine so the, ch the capuchins had to give us things back to get a treat mm -hmm. and they we had to have all the things back to have a treat so it's more efficient to nest them and hand it all back at once than to hand it back one at a time it takes longer so they had an incentive to stack them and get the job done quickly. So that was the training. And once they figured out that what we wanted them to do was to pass the things back, then they spontaneously would do this. There's individual variability in how well they do it and so on. But we didn't, we didn't train them, technically train them to insert mm -hmm. the cups. Mm -hmm. They do that themselves. Okay, thanks. <coughs> Um, they can move a cursor through a two-dimensional alley maze that has choice points in it, and they can learn to do that. It takes a long time. This one takes a lot of practice. It takes a long time for them to learn to avoid the dead end, but they will eventually do that. Um, they can use a laser pointer to indicate a distant object. They can use touchscreen tasks. They can do many things. They can stack blocks even when they have irregular features. 
they can, I've, I've, this one shows four blocks, but they, if you give them nine blocks, they'll stack nine blocks. It's, it's not so stable, but you know, I mean, the number of blocks is not the issue. They just keep going up. Um, they can place objects into matching grooves in a fixed surface, and I want to talk about this one in more detail. Um, this is just showing some data about successful seriation of five cups. I also want to point out, um, we did this also with chimpanzees, and we did it with um, a series of, of uh, groups of children at a very young age. Notice our oldest age group is 21 months. Uh, th these are very young kids. Kids are not usually proficient at seriating cups until somewhere around three. So, you know, we were at the very beginning. I'm not trying to claim that these children were, they're not developmentally delayed in any way. They're normal kids. Um, but by 21 months, they're, they're just getting to the point where they can do this problem. The monkeys and the apes, okay, so 50% of the time, roughly not all the time, 50% of the time, they manage to do it. And chimpanzees are right there with the capuchins. They have no advantage. And this is uh, something that's characteristic of most of the studies that I have done, which uh, many of them have been comparative involving capuchins and chimpanzees. And we find very few differences. It is not the case that chimpanzees have some uh, stupendous advantage when it comes to solving these kinds of spatial problems. Um, success at seriating, uh, at putting the sixth cup in. Um, remember, there were very few children. Uh, we're, we're working with very little kids, and um, only two kids managed to do that. Um, more than half of the, capuch uh, the capuchins and about a third of the chimps. We work with very small sample sizes, so don't draw too strong conclusions from the variability that, that I show. Um, we had eight capuchins and we had, I think, six chimpanzees. And in this kind of work, that's the sample sizes you get. So we don't make big claims about statistical power. We're, we just present them as what we have. All right, so now I want to spend some time talking about alignment, which I think of as a, an underlying ability that is present in much of our tool use, in, in the way that humans use tools. So um, I wanted to see how non-human primates uh, did this. So we used another pass-back task. That is, the, this, the, the participants had to do something with that stick to put it into a tray and then pass the tray back to us, and then they got a treat for doing that. So we gave them sticks and trays, and uh, in the baseline condition, the tray is wide open, so it's permissive. You just put the stick down in anywhere in that tray, and it works. You can pass it back to us. Um, then we made the tray have just one long groove in it. Then subsequently, we gave them a cross stick, and then finally something we called a tomahawk, which has three different features to align. <clears throat> okay, and we scored a lot of things about how they put it down, and this is showing our coding scheme, which I don't really have time to talk about, so I'm just going to show you the video of what they did. Um, now let's see. Um, this is um, a baseline trial, just showing you, okay, that's easy. And then they, they still like the stick, and then pass it back. All right. Um, this, uh, these are adults. This uh, is what? At the time they did this, I think it was about 20. But an adult, adult capuchin is maybe seven. This one he didn't have any trouble with. <coughs> Sometimes they did, but not yeah. in that case. Cross is a problem. <laughs> he doesn't have a clue. <laughs> <coughs> now let's see. Okay, now here's some chimpanzees doing the same thing. <laughs> so he got that one. So I, I forgot to put on this slide, this work was done collaboratively with colleagues at the Language Research Center of Georgia State University, and Charlie Menzel is my chief collaborator on this. And uh, you, you may know Charlie Menzel for his work with Pansy on chimpanzee memory. His, that's his special 
area of interest. Okay, so some data from these studies. If you just look at um, how many times, how many attempts they made to put the stick in in each of the different shapes, you get this big jump between the bar and the cross, between one and two features that have to be aligned. And that's true in both species, that the, the cross and the tomahawk, and there's no difference between cross and tomahawk. Once you hit two, you've already hit the, the, the difficult level. Um, then we looked at alignment using a clock face rubric. And we looked at the proportion of attempts that, that fell into the different clock face positions where 12-6 is, uh, is the correct alignment. And um, we find, again, that you know, most of the time <laughs> they're, they're doing the same thing. There is a bias for the 12-6 orientation, but it's not huge. It's less than half the time. Less than half the time they're lining up the long axis of the stick to the long axis of the groove. They, so, so they solve these problems, but they do it through brute force repetition, not by precise management. We looked at how often they put the um, cross piece in the right end of the, of the thing. Most of the time they did not put the crossed piece at the end of the groove that had the crossed position. Um, developmental data, like if they try this for a month or two months, do they get better? I wish I did, and that's something that should be done, and no, I don't. <coughs> but So I don't know if they could learn to pay attention to these features, but the, it isn't something that they just do. So I, so I don't know. I, I expect that they could improve, but I haven't done that. Yeah? What about children? I mean, It's coming next. Okay, so we replicated this with two, three, and four-year-old children, and um, can you can you put this? Oh, I want to turn the sound off. Put it in for me. Hmm. <laughs> she really needs a pencil. Okay, put it forget there. the can narration. The I don't I don't know if you can turn the sound off. <laughs> if can I do it? Yeah, you can. All right, good. Yeah, because I don't I don't want you to be distracted by the sound. There's all kinds of normal chit chat that's happening. Okay, this is also a two-year-old. So she's not perfect at getting it in because it didn't just slide in, but she went to the right place and she gets it in. Two. Three. Four. This is the tomahawk. So notice that there is, when I look at that, I interpret her actions as indicating she sees the triangular part of that tomahawk, and she is trying to fit that in. She's paying attention to that feature, but it isn't going, and she had to rotate, she had to flip the stick to do it. Um, <clears throat> so the tomahawk is still a challenge, but they manage it. And she also did something that we never saw any non-human primate do, which is to hold the stick above the tray and kind of look at it. You know, she's doing this and, and, and sort of assessing the fit between this stick and the, and the groove. We never saw anything like that in any of the non-human primate trials. So that's something um, that was very striking to me. Okay, so um, children, they could do this. They generally got all the sticks in the right way, except the two-year-olds with the tomahawk. That was tough for them. Pardon? It's, it's 30 minutes? Okay. All right. Well, so we're going to come to this conclusion. Um, there are various forms of data to support it that I just flipped through. Um, that there is a big difference between non-human primates and children in that alignment is easy for humans, but not for non-human primates. And I think, I think this is a fundamental constraint on the kinds of tool use that we see in non-human primates. Okay. Worth it to, to add uh, some detail to this. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you look at the, the, the duration of the engagement of the subject with the task, mm -hmm. does that vary a lot? Like do the, the, the um, primates two year give olds, up? Two year, no, two-year-olds give up. Non-human okay. primates 
uh, are motivated by this external reward. Kids are motivated by some adult saying, would you please do this? So uh, we don't, uh, you know, we just encourage them to keep so going. So there's no real difference in time on task? Well, the, the non-human primates take longer. So they are on task longer. It takes them longer to do it. They take many more attempts. The kids do these things uh, when they're lining them up and slot slipping them in. It's one or two attempts. The, the, the capuchins and the chimps generally take at least four times that. So there's, there's a, a, you know, it takes longer to, to do these things. Okay, so. Something like that, yeah. It's true that, that children have more exposure to this kind of toy and play, and we, we have no way to control for that. We're just giving them our, our particular objects, which are not the same as their toy objects particularly. But they're, they're similar, I agree, yeah. Um, okay, <clears throat> so we've done over the 20 years or so that I was doing this kind of work, and I'm still doing it, but I cut it off at 2003. Um, they use tools in the lab in lots of different ways. <clears throat> at the time I was doing this work, we had not yet discovered that a, a population that used tools in the wild. So we were always trying to figure out what's the biological importance of this. We see this in the lab. We don't see anything like it in the wild. And, and then we discovered it that they do it in the wild. And <clears throat> that's what I want to talk about next. And um, Leah has nuts to hand out about now. Um, this is my field site, and now I can The sound can be on now. I, I turned it on here. But yeah, we should have found. I heard it. OK. Thank you. So take those out of the bag. Here, here, yeah. There's, yeah, there, there's three. Some are cut and one is whole. So they're cracking these nuts, not just these nuts. These are sample. There's actually more than nine species of palms in this area that they crack. Um, <clears throat> and some of them are very hard. And I'm giving you the, the examples of the hard ones. And I'm wearing them as earrings, too, if you want to look at them later. Um, it's really hard material. And uh, it's impressively difficult to crack. I can tell you because some of our um, research team can't crack these nuts. We've tried. I mean, we, it's, it's the first, well, it's not something we do on the second day that we arrive at the field station is everybody who has not been there before gets a chance to try to crack the nuts. And there's a reasonable proportion of people that cannot do it. So, and remember, these monkeys weigh two or three or four kilos, and they can do it. So prepare to be impressed. Um, OK, so um, this work is done in the state of Piauí, uh, which is in the northeast of Brazil. This is Brazil. Salvador is over here, for those of you who can orient to that. Rio and Sao Paulo are, are, are down here somewhere. Uh, so it's, in, it's considered northeast. And it's in a Cejado habitat, which is open woodland. It's deciduous. In the dry season, the leaves drop, and it looks rather wintry like this. This is a, this, a dry season. And it's a, an eroding sandstone plain with, with ridges and cliffs. It's very beautiful. It looks like sort of like New Mexico in the Americas, if you know that area. We do at this field site many different kinds of work, ecological, geological, everything. And uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about this later if there's some aspect of it that you're interested in. One of the new things we're doing, I've misspelled this word, is archaeology. I forgot the A in there. Um, but we're doing, and we're looking at vocalization. I mean, many things. This is a field site that does many different things. And it's an international team. And I'm just one member of a big team. Remember that. Um, OK. so. This is a sort of closer up view of an excellent technique. Two, three. OK, 
Okay, so I'm interested in what's skillful about what he's doing. <coughs> this guy weighs 1,300 grams, 1,385. <coughs> and he's holding a stone that weighs 500 grams. <coughs> So this, this gives you an indication of why this is challenging. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what we know about it, which isn't everything. He doesn't crack it, by the way. And he did this for 20 minutes. He also, I didn't include it here because the film just goes on and on. He subsequently gave up on this 500 gram stone. He began to use a stone that weighs more than he weighs. He began to use a 1500 gram stone, which he could just barely lift up onto the anvil. And then he would get up on the anvil, and then the stone would fall off. And he'd get down, and he'd pick it up, and he'd put it on the anvil. And then he'd pick it up and go, ugh, and then the nut would fall off. So I mean, it was just a, a comedy of errors. But he never, he never cracked the nut. Yeah, yeah. Just, just like metabolically speaking, do they burn more calories than they get from this nut? Um, Is it something they that's enjoy? It. So <laughs> it, you would, at 20 minutes, I would say yes. But, but, um, but, it, but the adults, no. For the adults, this is an energetically beneficial thing to do. Um, for the little ones, obviously not, because they're practicing and practicing and practicing or playing, if you like, and they are not getting anything out of this in the way of calories. Yeah. It, it, sometimes it looks that way. Yeah, I agree. Um, so this is what it looks like before. It's just percussion. And this is the kind of percussion they use when they're foraging. That's the nut. It's just handling the nut directly. They also handle stones directly, but they handle nuts directly more often. And every now and then you stop and eat a bug, you know. With nut decimation, how specific is that? How specific to and individuals? It's all possible or? nuts okay. to encounter or only those of a certain shape and size and texture and so on? Um, I can't say, but for sure any nut that's around on the ground that is in an area where adults have been cracking, any nut. They also, are, they also are attracted to nut shells, and the nut shells accumulate near the anvils. So there are artifacts from the other's cracking activity that build up, and they have a long duration. Those are the, the shells, we've made a, an area where we're looking at how the shells look as they age over time, so we can determine something about the time since when we encounter a new anvil and we see shells on it to know how long it's been that the shells were there. And uh, it's, uh, let's see, it's in its 10th year now, and the shells are great. So, I mean, they don't degrade. So there's a lot of shells around, and they spend a lot of time investigating those as well. Okay, so I want to know about the skill and how they become skillful at this kind of activity. And the perspective I bring to it uh, comes from ecological psychology, from the Gibsonian perspective about using the senses using the senses as perceptual systems for generating information, for per performing perception action routines to gain information from action. And that comes out of the Gibsonian tradition. And also uh, with attention to degrees of freedom in the problem, um, which is something that was um, highlighted uh, in movement science by Nikolai Bernstein, who's a Russian physiologist, contemporary of Pavlov, but whose work was translated into English in the 1960s, and he's had a, a very profound influence on the field since that time. So these are sort of the great-grandparents of my perspective. <coughs> All right, so I'm going to give two examples of, of um, yeah, thanks. Please return the nuts when you're done. <laughs> so, um, of um, ways of measuring skill in this percussive tool use. And one in, uh, is placing the nut in a stable position on an anvil. So we, we noticed, it's obvious, that the monkeys put the nuts into a pit on the anvil surface. 
And this, uh, we've tried what happens if you put the nut in a pit or not ourselves. And when you put the nut outside of a pit and hit it, it's, it's very likely to just fly off the anvil. So um, it's, I don't think it's uh, an accident at all that the monkeys put the whole nuts into the pit. Once it's cracked and has a flat surface, then they put it outside the pit and put the flat surface down. So they position the nut rather carefully <coughs> in a way that seems um, effective. And when the monkeys release the nut in the anvil, we notice that they typically knock the nut. So I'll take this whole nut and give you an example. They, they do this kind of thing, and then they release it. So we asked ourselves, is that just superstitious behavior? Are they just jittery? Why are they knocking the nut? Could it have something to do with positioning the nut systematically? So we did a little experiment. This is such a fun experiment to do. We um, took the nuts, like the ones you've seen, and we uh, rolled them on a concrete floor that was relatively flat. And where they stopped rolling, we marked that on the uh, stop as a stop meridian on the top and on the, and on the opposite side where it was on the floor. And then we marked the other side as a roll meridian. And then we filmed the monkeys with these marked nuts. And then we scored um, many things about their behavior with the nuts. So this gives you a sense of the variety and shape of these nuts. Some of them are rather symmetrical and some of them are far from symmetrical. And they differ in size and, and so they're variable. So this is supposed to play. Left side towards me, red side towards me. Black side up, black up, uh, black hatch up, um, black hatch up, black hatch still up. Nut 71, going to Jatoba. That was perfect delivery, if I do say so. Cross hatch up. Cross hatch up. Cross hatch up. He cracks it right on the meridian. Very accommodating, he was. Um, so the answer is yes. They place the nuts systematically in a particular orientation on the anvil in that pit. And knocking seems to be part of how they do that. So they generally knock about five times. I mean, there's a lot of variability. Um, they put that stop meridian facing up uh, almost all the time. The, when they release the nut, it doesn't wobble or move around. And they don't do this above the anvil, and they don't feel in the pit So with their hands directly. They knock the nut in the pit. So they're detecting something about the position of the nut in the pit, and then they release it. Okay, so we asked if people would do the same. So we did this with blindfolded people, and seven men, seven women, and we used the same kinds of marked nuts. And we asked them to put them in the anvil as if they were going to crack them. And they reliably placed them with a stop meridian facing up, just as the monkeys do. And then we asked people to look at the nuts, not to do anything with them, but just look at the nuts and tell us when we rotated it about the long axis where it looked the most symmetrical in their view. And if you do that, if you bisect it, that, that is the stop meridian. So when they are putting it in the pit, the more symmetrical edges of the nut are facing the edges of the pit, which is the more stable position, which is what people do as well. You do it blindfolded. So this is not a visually guided action, I'm relatively sure. And this is the human version of that. So they strategically manage the fit between the variable nuts and the pits and the anvil, and they're generating information to do that through manual action. That's my conclusion. All right, um, so now I wanted to tell you about a study that's in progress. I don't have a lot of data, but I just want to sort of show you what we're doing. Um, and we're looking at the skill involved in controlling the stone on its downward trajectory in particular. Um, so we did this with unfamiliar stones. 
That is, th these, these are stones that on their initial presentation, the monkeys had not used before. Of course, then they practice with them, and they're not, they're not unfamiliar. They become more familiar as they work with them. But they are initially, at least, unfamiliar. And we, we're using slow motion video. And I'm just going to present some data from four adult monkeys. We're in the middle of scoring this. We also have these videos um, for um, young monkeys, but I, I, we haven't analyzed them yet. So what I'm talking about today is just their first 20 strikes on a whole nut. And we looked at the kinds of actions they performed with the stone, including flipping and spinning the stone, and a preparatory lift, which is something like this. You've got this heavy stone, and they stand bipedally to do this. Bipedal, bipedal locomotion and bipedal stance is another thing we've studied, but I, I don't have time to talk about that today. But if you're interested, I've got great video. Um, so a preparatory lift is where they've got this heavy stone and go, uh, uh, and they crack without the sound effects. Um, but but it's, it, humans also do this. I mean, you, it's, it's something, you, you know, you, tip, you pick up the hammer, you go, tuk, tuk, and then you, it's a, it's a sort of tuning or calibrating action. Um, so we looked to see if they did things like that. And then we looked at what part of the stone struck the nut. Okay, so see that nut didn't move. This is the first time he's used this stone. And he knocked the nut, so he has to reposition it. What he does with this stone. Now, I, I have to tell you, there's a lot of rebound on the anvil. And the, 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 the anvil I had positioned, I had moved that piece of wood. So it wasn't very well settled in the ground. So it's not a great anvil. <laughs> it bounced. That's my fault, not his. So you can see, if you're interested in behavior, there's a lot to code here. There's a lot going on. And then he's going to finish. And he's going to first pick out an invertebrate, larvae, a beetle pupa that is in there. They, they especially love that about the nuts. They, li they eat the nut kernels, but they especially love the beetle larvae that inhabit the nuts. So he goes for that first. OK, so <clears throat> what we found, they nearly always hit the nut straight on. And this is uh, 100% is up here. This is 100%. So they're somewhere in the 90s. Uh, this, this is the largest stone. And it drops down to something like you know, the median is sort of about 89. So they're almost always coming straight down with the stone, which is the most effective thing to do. <coughs> and <coughs> so the stone rarely fell off the anvil, unlike what you saw with the little guy who was practicing. Um, they flipped and spun the stones, as you saw. They do preparatory lifts sometimes. And they struck the nut within two centimeters of the center of mass of the stone um, more than 80% of the time. This is on their first 20 strikes with a new stone. And <clears throat> so these are the strikes for one. This is a, a two kilo female using this stone that weighs half her body weight, a little more than half her body weight. And she's striking it right here. And the, I didn't mark the center of mass, but it's right about here. So she's getting almost all her strikes on that center of mass, which is what you want to do. So are they skillful? I think they're skillful. Um, so the dispersion on that stone was what, one, two centimeters about? Two centimeters. Oh, the scale. Yeah, the I should put The dispersion of these hit points. Yeah, yeah. It's within two centimeters of okay. the center of mass. Yeah, it's not right on. No. It's, it's in a zone. Yeah, yeah. Um, OK. Now I want to talk about learning to use tools. So we see a lot of this. 
uh, where little ones are just sort of standing right next to or in the face of uh, someone else who's cracking. And um, it, it seems clear that there is a lot of social influence. So primates have complex long-term social relationships. They recognize individuals. They have kin relations. We've talked about this, um, and Danielle knows exactly what I'm talking about, that there are um, a lot of differentiated social relationships within the group. In capuchins, adults are tolerant of young monkeys, and unlike um, the macaques that many people are familiar with, a capuchin baby can run around in the group and go to anybody and climb on anybody, and in a pinch, if there's a, a problem, it can jump on anybody. The adult males will sometimes carry kids. Uh, all individuals will play with the kids. Adult males will play with everybody, and the juveniles all play with each other. It's, it's a relatively relaxed uh, social context for the very young individuals. After about 18 months, then they have to start following more adult etiquette, and they are more constrained in what they can do and where they can go, and they're less tolerated at cracking sites. But for the first year and a half, they have free run of everywhere. Um, so we did this work with one habituated group of monkeys that's roughly around 20 or 22 animals, and we observed all the monkeys that were three months through six years. Um, and then we didn't do this continuously. I wish we could have, but we do these things in a field season. So around two months per period, twice a year, um, between June 2011 and July 2013. And Yonat Eshkar is the person who's principally responsible for these data sets. She's my PhD student at the moment. Um, so what we have at the moment is 59 subject samples where we took all the data collected for one individual over a two-month period, and I'm calling that a sample here. Um, and we have on average 38 observations per individual in that sample. <coughs> so it winds up to be a total of 12 hours per observation period per monkey. And we followed each monkey for 20 minutes at a time. So that means you go where the monkey goes for 20 minutes, um, which is challenging. Um, <coughs> Okay, so this is roughly the timeline, and I tried to animate this the way you guys have animated your slides. I don't know how you do that. It was not working for me. So I'm just going to do it this way, that um, at, when the babies are very young, they spend less time on the ground. Um, kids that are um, more than a year old spend about 30% of their time on the ground <coughs> than the adults do as well. So they're relatively terrestrial. <coughs> So the babies are uh, up to six months. We don't see much of them. They're not coming down. <coughs> and after that, they begin to come down. And then between one and two, you see a lot of this kind of activity where kids are fascinated with nuts, and they're hanging around the adults, and they're playing with, with pieces of nuts and stones. And then between two and four, you see endless practice. And that's why this is repeated. You do it, and then you do it again, and then you do it again, and then you do it again. And they just keep at it. <coughs> Persistent practice. And finally, somewhere around five, they can do this. So there is about a, you know, a four-year period where they are practicing. And so they're investing a lot of energy in practice, which for them, no doubt, is play. Hi. Yeah. Just a question. So do, will mothers or adults give the babies nuts that they crack? No. The adults do not directly assist in any way. The adults allow the kids to be near. They, they, they will you know, allow them to take cracked bits, <coughs> but they don't, you know, there's, there's no, no, no. I have once seen direct giving, something that I would recognize as direct giving, where a kid was insistently doing this. It wasn't near an anvil, it was up in a tree. <clears throat> and it was uh, some piece of food that the adult was eating, and the kid was just going like this, and, 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 and finally the adult just sort of dropped it into the kid's hand. But I've seen that once. I mean, it's extremely rare, and I've never seen it around an anvil. <clears throat> okay, so kids spend time on the ground. They, uh, they manipulate objects very frequently, and um, I've marked here in the lab area and outside the lab area, there's, a, there's an area of, the, of their home range that the monkeys come to frequently, which is where we've done this filming. And we call that our lab area. When we do something experimental, we do it there. Like when we present unusual stones or when we present marked nuts, we do it in our lab area. And we can do that when the monkeys show up. If they don't show up, 
we don't do it. It's on their schedule. Um, so we've collected data both in that area and, and also wherever the monkeys go. And what I want to show you here is that it doesn't matter where we are. The, the behavior is basically the same. And if anything, <coughs> excuse me, they're manipulating objects, just all objects, more frequently outside the lab area. They're doing a lot of watching adults in the, in the lab area. <coughs> okay. So monkeys older than a year manipulate nuts as often as everything else that they're manipulating. And this is from the, the lab area, where there are a lot of nut shells and a lot of anvils around. <coughs> These are all our kids. So you'll notice there's a lot of individual scatter. There's a lot of variability in this individual. And so, you know, that's, that's the way they are. Um, <coughs> they start hitting the nut directly and then they shift to striking it with a stone. That's the red here, strike with a stone. So that begins to appear between their first and second birthday. This is zero to one. This is one to two. So they begin to do that, and then that becomes more frequent. There's all sorts of other manipulation that continues, and that has to, because processing a nut also involves peeling off bits of the shell and scraping out the kernel. So there will always be other manipulation. Okay, so. Anyway, and they, they continue to do some direct percussion, which is not an error. It's, uh, you know, you, when, when the nut is partly cracked and you want to get a kernel out, sometimes you can just knock it out if you knock, knock the nut. So it, 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 um, it isn't very effective, but it's something that never goes to zero. The adults do some of that as well. All right, so the second year. <coughs> the second year is when a lot of this is happening. This is between 12 months and 24 months. This is the year when kids are weaned. They're weaned, it's a gradual process, but somewhere between 12 and 24 months, they're weaned. <coughs> and so they are busy trying to feed themselves. And at this time, they weigh mm, a little more than a kilo. <coughs> they're very little. And they don't have their full dentition. They're scrawny little things trying to feed themselves. And they eat the same things that the adults eat. There is no weaning diet of pulpy, fleshy fruits or something like that, which is true for some old world species. They're eating exactly the same diet as the adults. So <clears throat> they're working hard. Um, they percuss nuts directly far more often than the other age groups. They practice positioning nuts and striking more than the kids that are older or younger than they are. Um, and they, <clears throat> okay, I think that's all I wanted to say to reduce time. Okay, now I want to talk about social influence, going back here. So, repeating. It's somewhere around five. They're proficient. And in two, they're doing all of this. It's, it's a phenomenal period. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what about social influence? So, in, in primatology uh, and in animal behavior in general, there's a lot of interest in animal traditions and in culture and in the possibility that there are skills that are passed down uh, from one individual to the next, um, and, and that we can talk about uh, cultural evolution as well as um, genetic evolution or biological evolution. So it's often framed in that way as an either or, um, which is not the best way to pose it, but that's how it's often posed. So there's a lot of interest in animal cultures. And you can see in the press periodically, people are reporting on a new animal um, a new animal culture. So we know that there are new Caledonian crows that use uh, objects as tools and they talk about a culture for that. And people often talk about cultures in, in chimpanzees and cultures in orangutans, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of interest in this. Um, so this, we're, we're interested in it too. And for sure, for sure, social activity and social context is important. Is it critical? Is it essential? I don't think so. Individuals do discover this sort of thing on their own, but at a very low rate, and in our group, all the monkeys do this cracking. So something is boosting this discovery rate, and, <clears throat> and I think that something is social influence in many forms, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. Okay, so mostly I'm just showing you here that they um, <clears throat> are um, uh, interested in nuts. They are more interested in nuts when others are around them cracking. Well, this makes sense because they're also scrounging. Um, this is all the kids, all of them. So this is zero to six. 
This is everybody, all the kids. Um, and the rate at which they manipulate nuts increases a whole lot when they're near an anvil, which also makes sense because that's where there are uh, lots of debris. And this is, um, it's really the anvil that is facilitating their interaction <coughs> with nuts. But they're drawn to the anvil when somebody else is there. So the adult activity is sort of drawing them to the right place. You can call it local enhancement. It's increasing their interest in this place. And when they get there, then they start to fiddle around with the nuts and the materials. They also touch the stones that the adults are using, but they can't lift them. So there's no way that they can reuse a tool that an adult has used. In chimpanzees, the kids will reuse tools. And even in tools that, for example, they have to manufacture uh, uh, probing tools, well, kids, young kids do not manufacture their probing tools. They reuse one that's there. And they don't begin to manufacture their probing tools until they're, I don't know, something like four or five years old. So there's initially reuse of, of, of tools. Well, in the capuchins, reuse is common because the stones remain on the anvils. So all animals of all ages reuse tools that other individuals have used, including that they themselves used just the day before, because the stone remains on the anvil for the most part. So reuse is not a useful concept for the capuchins. It is for the, for the chimpanzees with, uh, with ephemeral tools that, that they have to remake or refine every day. But in the case of capuchins, the nuts and the stones are, are there, the shells and the stones and the anvils are there. And so the adults support the kids' learning by providing artifacts. And these artifacts endure in time. That means whenever you run into an anvil, even if an adult's not around, you run into the anvil, there's stuff there. There's stuff there that's appealing. And it smells like nuts. There's an oily resin that is around. And there's bits of nuts debris still in the shells. You can still pick out some little tiny bit that somebody overlooked. So it's, it's, like, a, you know, it's like coming on a buffet table after somebody cleared it. But there's still crumbs all over the place. <laughs> <coughs> OK, so adults nut cracking influences the juvenile's behavior while they're cracking. And the durable artifacts that are left appear to play a, 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 an important role, equally important. I don't know if I can assign a quantitative value to it at the moment. But it, it definitely supports exploration and practice. And this individual practice is intrinsically motivated because the kids are not getting anything out of it. It's motivated intrinsically and by the social influence of hearing and seeing others cracking. And this supports a very long learning period. So they're putting in their 10,000 hours. But, and it's unsupervised practice. But it's, it's motivated intrinsically by their own interest in percussion, which they do anyway, and by the artifacts that are associated with all this wonderful activity that they've seen. Yeah? Have you ever had that supervision? Is it 100% unsupervised? Uh, in, it's in, unsupervised. In what you've the adults do not pay any attention to the kids cracking, as long as they're not taking their nut, the adult's nut. I mean, there's, sort of supervision. There's, a, there's a certain amount of, you know, possession, um, but they're, they're remarkably tolerant of the, of the kids. And actually, I worry more about the kids getting whacked with a stone because the kids are not paying attention. Well, they, they do, but they look like they're getting very close. And if I were able to intervene, I would just move the kid back a scooch because they're, they're going to get whacked. But they, they are right there looking at the stone coming down. <coughs> OK, so um, this tool use involves producing two spatial relations in sequence. First, you put the nut on the anvil. Then you put the stone on the nut. It's variable. It's adapted to local circumstances, different stones, different anvils, different nuts. And it's effective when, by the time they're around five or six, it becomes effective. It involves skill and judgment to select the right stone, to position the nut, and so on and so forth. And it's acquired, acquired laboriously, a lot of practice over a long developmental time period in a supportive social context. So that's, that's the story. OK, so now if I were going to design a robot or something like that, um, this is what I would think of putting in it somehow. And this is terribly underspecified for what an engineer has to do, but it's the best I can offer. Um, first of all, there should be some perception action routine that involves combining objects, which in, in non-human primates is associated with extractive foraging. I don't know if robots can forage. 
um, there has to be salience of kinesthetic and tactile perception while handling these objects. There has to be some intrinsic motivation to do all this. Um, there has to be enough motor coordination to achieve control of object positioning. There has to be enough, I don't know whether to call it uh, attention switching or, or hierarchical integration. I don't know exactly how to talk about these, this, but you have to work with concurrent or quickly in succession multiple relations. Uh, and this is something that developmental psychologists have talked about for a long time, and, and a person, Robbie Fisher's work has always been interesting to me in this regard. He's sort of a neo-Piagetian, but there's many different ways that developmental psychologists talk about this general problem. Um, there has to be sensitivity to edges and contours. You have to be able to do allocentric orientation. That is not just your body to the world, but this other thing to something out there. It's allocentric, outside the body. Um, and you have to have a long enough attention span to go through the whole cycle. I don't know if you noticed, but capuchin monkeys, every four seconds, roughly, they look away. This, th th this is, uh, uh, I don't know, it seems to be, I think it's an endogenous rhythm myself, but they have a, 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 you know, a, a very quick um, uh, scanning cycle. And that interrupts paying attention to what you're doing. Um, and you have to be able to learn from knowledge of results. This is from the motor learning literature. They talk about knowledge of results. It's the outcome of your action, of your motor action, to manage variable situations, to become skillful. So, but there are also some relevant external parameters. There's, there's the artifacts that support practice. There's social support for practice, which sort of gets it going, prompts it. And there's a lot of time for practice, just extended time. So that has to be part of the system somewhere. And I think that's the end. And now I want to acknowledge a lot of people, many students um, and colleagues, and particularly my Ethosebus colleagues, um, this group of people, uh, Patricia Itzar and Elizabeth Wieselbergi, who are my partners in crime for most of this stuff, and many students that work with us, and my funding institutions, um, which includes also um, in f funding uh, that is for a field site from, um, from other places. So thank you very much. Okay, um, we, have, we, we actually have lots of time for questions. First of all, I want to say that was fantastic. <laughs> I think we all agree that was really spectacular. Thanks. Could the looking away have some function? Are they worried about predators? Are they worried about competition? Both, amongst all of that, yeah. I mean, it, it, scanning is, is uh, thought to have multiple functions. And uh, we know, okay, I have, a, I have a work in progress about this um, that I'll send to you when we, when we have it accepted. <laughs> okay. yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Now, uh, my question is, what do you think is the role of body morphology in this case? Um, and more in terms of computation, what's the role of morphological computation? In this I, sense? I, well, so you mean sort of limb lengths? Yeah, I mean, what's the importance <laughs> of, let's say, the body morphology in this sense? Because you were mentioning some birds, for example, from New Caledonia. Yeah, yeah that are able to use tools yeah. besides well, they, like not having like grasping. Right, they hold it in the beak. Yeah, and exactly. there's, there's some discussion whether their beaks are actually altered a little bit to allow them to see better the tip at the, at the end. Their beaks seem to be shaped a little bit differently than other yeah. crow's beaks. I'm, it's so been yeah, suggested. But, uh, uh, but, but what about in this percussion? So what I would tell you uh, pertains, are you talking about probing? No, I'm, well, I'm talking everything. about tool use in general. I mean, how I would much say you, you make use of the body you've got, and the, you know, dolphins can use sticks as tools by holding it in the beak. So you can mm -hmm. do, you can use a flipper to clean a mirror. I mean, um, so you think that body mor morphology in this sense is not that relevant? Holding itself, grasp, grasping hands is surely helpful. Grasping hands in a place where you have binocular focal vision—that's even better. So those things help for sure, and, and if you are supposed to be doing some sort of precise alignment, being able to see as well as feel uh, helps. But as you could see for the, for the non-human primates, I mean, I don't think seeing the edge helps them a whole lot. They're not looking at the edge exactly. 
mean, they're, they're looking at it as a zone or something. I don't know. They're not perceiving it the same way we are. So that's not a matter of morphology. I would say once you've got enough uh, motor dexterity to orient an object and to use whatever sensory modality you need to align it, which could be haptic as well as vision. I mean, could a blind robot do this? Probably, but you'd have to build in some other components. That's my best guess. Uh, I've got two questions. First is very, very short on the, on the scan cycle. Is there a rhythm in this? Is there like a, a temporal Okay, we rhythm? think, we're, we're working on it, but w our data suggests it's about four seconds. Okay. And the other one is, um, if you go back to the, to the second year when they're when they like trying out different strategies, if, if you will, of how to, and, and start using the stone, um, is there also play with the stones? Did you see sure. playing behavior that actually sure. is not really? It's all play. They're not, they're not getting anything out of it. I mean, so play is like tool use. It's the definition of it is always under revision and open to discussion. <coughs> I would say this is a, a lot, it's, it's intrinsically motivated exploration of objects. If you want to call it object play, I'd say that's about right. Yeah. So, so they're playing, they're playing with, yeah. I mean, does it make a difference if you call it play or practice? Well, I mean, maybe we can talk to the other people about this. Okay, but okay we can we talk about it later. So what happens if you removed the stones from the anvils? Do they go and find oh, replacements? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, if you, sure, they'll, they'll go and get it and take it to the anvil bipedally. Is it the adults that would do that then? Well, it has to be someone big enough to carry that stone. So it depends on the weight of the stone. Would, have you ever seen the infants attempt on an empty anvil? Um, so the onset of bipedal locomotion. So first of all, bi so bipedal stance uh, is apparent by, uh, in arboreally as well as on the ground. I mean, they, that this is routine. The, these monkeys will stand bipedally to do many things and walk bipedally on branches as well. But on the ground, so talking about on the ground. Um, and they will transport stones through the trees bipedally, but not so often. It's usually on the ground. So um, little kids are coming to the ground in their first year, and they're playing on the ground a little bit, and, and there's a little bit of bipedal stance, but not a lot of bipedal locomotion. Um, I don't have those data. Michelle Verderen in our group is looking at uh, infant development um, in social context, but she has also a lot of film of the monkeys uh, in their bipedal activity. So I can't tell you precisely, but I think it is in the second year. They begin to walk bipedally, but they're not yet able at that point to carry something. They're not big enough. You're talking about little tiny monkeys that weigh less than a kilo, and they're not carrying very much around. Um, but by the time they're two, they're, they're underway, and they would carry something that is light enough for them to carry. Um, to have a big stone on an anvil, yes. And there are hundreds of anvils in our area. We've mapped them. We've mapped many of them. We haven't mapped them all. Um, hi. Uh, thank you very much. It was incredible. Uh, one question. How, how much are the kids uh, influenced in terms of technique? Uh, by the adults? Well, the, the, the technique it? is constrained by the physics of the situation. So there's only so many ways to lift a stone and strike down with it. But, but um, individuals develop their own idiosyncratic methods. One, one method is to stand a little bit far back and then jump. We have a few individuals that do that. <coughs> one other method is to lift the stone so high that you jump right off the anvils. A couple of individuals do that. It's, it actually looks like uh, human uh, weightlifting. If you look at the diagrams of human weightlifting where the feet come off the ground, it looks exactly like that. Um, so and they're some not don't directly do that. influenced That's by. Individually constructed. I have a question. If there are exceptions to the rule, like uh, in a group, do all, are there individuals which, which don't learn we this? We had one individual who did not crack, um, who appeared motorically able to do so, and she did not crack. She's not in the group anymore, but she was a successful, healthy adult, and she didn't crack. And then we have an, an individual who has a, she seemed to have an endocrinological disorder of some kind and was stunted and 
a little deformed, and she didn't crack, but she was not strong enough. And are there groups, you mentioned in the beginning that there are groups from the same species where you probably, there are some groups where you wouldn't see this. So th this is a very interesting question, whether, whether this is something that is characteristic of the species, and are there any groups that don't do it? And I would say, so I don't know of groups that don't do it, but um, my colleagues tell me that there are groups that don't do it, or at least we don't know that they do it. Um, and this is something we are trying to assess right now. Um, it's, it's something that's going to depend upon the, the um, vulnerability of animals on the ground, their willingness to be on the ground. And if there is a, a, a strong terrestrial predatory complement, they're probably going to be a lot more careful. In our area, it's a very anthropogenically altered habitat. Um, the larger predators are not there. That is, there, there is still puma, but jaguar is gone. There's still snakes. There's still aerial predators. There are hawks. Um, but, but there are few terrestrial predators other than humans. And so the monkeys are willing to be on the ground. Now, whether, uh, whether this same species in another place with a different habitat composition of predators would do the same, we, we have to find out. It's a good question. Uh, Dorothy. Yes. Um, are there interesting comparisons here with tool use in early hominids that uh, maybe give us insights into the evolution of, of tool use in humans? I'm so glad you asked. Um, <coughs> let's see. This was prearranged. Um, pardon? No, no. I, I was jokingly saying that this was prearranged. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm looking for, let me see, I wrote down where I put those slides. Um, Somewhere here. Okay. Uh, if I go to slideshow, it's not going to go right to that point. So let me just leave it there right now. Yeah. Well, it'll go right there. Okay. So archaeologists uh, come to a site. They find they're usually, especially if you're looking millions of years, they're looking at stone. So stone tool use, percussive tool use, is interesting to archaeologists because they may be able to map something about the origins. They may be able to interpret early fossil human, human fossil sites better by knowing wear patterns in other species, for example, whether wear patterns, looking at the, the rate of, of uh, use wears uh, of site development and things like that. So <coughs> I'm collaborating as a member of a team with an archaeological investigation now, looking at the rate of use of site formation and use wear characteristics on the tools and on the anvils in our area, and whether there are actually artifacts buried in the sediment. Jury's still out on that. For sure we know about the site, the rate of site formation, and, the, uh, and we're starting to measure use wear on the stone tools. Um, this is an anvil from Olduvai Gorge. So in Olduvai, you probably know it's a famous archaeological site for early hominid remains. And um, uh, so people have put the onset of tool use at two and a half million years. But there are actually people are claiming that they have percussive tools, not altered flaked stones, but percussive tools three and a half million years ago. And <clears throat> I don't doubt it. I mean, you know, like taking a whole stone and using it as a percussor is something that would be very... I would think probable and expected. Uh, apes do it, capuchins do it, any, ex not any, but extractive foragers are likely to do this. And humans are extractive foragers. And human babies bang just like capuchin babies in that they are more alike than, than humans and chimps. Chimps are percussed rather rarely. But adult, uh, adult capuchins and baby capuchins percuss all the time. And human babies, you know, ask Gary, human babies percuss. It's, it's a common form of play. So the idea that humans should just sort of discover that there's something useful when you crush things with a big thing, that I think is very likely. But how do you recognize that a, this stone that's not been napped, not shaped, just the stone, how do you recognize that it's been used as a tool? How do you recognize that that's an anvil that's been used repeatedly for something percussive? Well, they, they, the archaeologists have ways to measure that in, for human sites, <coughs> and, we, and we measure the same for the non-human sites. This is an anvil 
And, um, you know, there's pits in it. We measure the pits. You can, you can measure many things. You can scan the tools and look for uh, the fibers on the stone. You can look um, that that slide I showed of the, the Burmese macaques, the stones, uh, you, the, the, the tool stones are scanned to look for use wear on the stones, and you can find it. So we can use these same archaeological tools and look at the the archaeological remains, the site remains for non-human species, then you have to say, well, when you encounter a site, how do you know it's a human site? And we have this problem in Brazil, in fact. There's a site, of a, a national park, where there are anvils and stone remains, and it's, it's interpreted by the park as evidence of human nutcracking. It looks exactly like capuchin nutcracking, and there are capuchins there, and they crack nuts. So, you know, is this a human site or is it a capuchin site or is it both? We don't know yet. So, so yes, there are, there's, there's interest also just from dating, you know, to know that, that tool use in these populations is an ancient phenomenon. And that's been done, uh, it's, been, it's begun with the chimpanzees and there's a site in the Thai forest and Ivory Coast that's been dated back, I think they went back like 6,000 years or something. And, and so it's still, you know, relatively modern. But anyway, a, 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 an old site. We're trying to see if, if there's anything at our site that we can date in that way. So, so far, no success on that, but we're, we're trying. Okay, I have one last, one yeah. last question. Yeah, so how creative this uh, monkeys are because they've been using this tool for a long time. Mm -hmm. So humans went beyond uh, stone uh, use. So how these uh, capuchin uh, monkeys do they, have you observed any uh, tool use different from the stone? Well, yes, because I haven't. I haven't, but in, in others have. So I'm not okay. talking about my own observations okay. now. But yes, so capuchin monkeys in the wild have been seen using uh, probing sticks for okay. to flush prey out of crevices, for fishing for termites. They've been used, seen using uh, excavation stones okay. to scrape soil and, to, and choppers to chop. Uh, crows have been uh, observed, s some crows in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, to have invented a new creative way of cracking Oh, you mean to nuts. drop the nuts in front of the car? Exactly, uh -huh. so it was more <coughs> efficient. So did the I wouldn't call that tool use. Yeah, but it's a creative process, <laughs> it's so a you it's have a to go beyond the problem. tool use. Yeah, yeah. Tool use is just yeah. a mean to an end, and if you can go faster to that end. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. have you observed any? Sure interesting Lots. behavior from so capuchin monkeys are renowned for this kind of activity and one of my favorite stories comes from Thomas Belt who was a naturalist in the early 1800s I don't know I don't remember exactly the year he was a European who went to live in um, Central America I think it would be Honduras at the moment but maybe Nicaragua I don't remember exactly where in Central America and he he was living uh, in a place where somebody else had a pet capuchin monkey. So this would have been Cebus capuchinus, different species than I've been talking about. And it was uh, on a collar um, and, you know, pinned to a stake so it could only go, you know, like a dog on a line, like that. So um, you have to confine it somehow. So it was on a line. So this, this capuchin would routinely take a piece of bread and put it out here and then wait for the chicken to come by and then snatch the chicken and then it ate the chicken. So, so you know, that's, that's, that's clever, that's clever. Yeah, so capuchins do that. Capuchins escape from their enclosures. When you have a, a, a captive cage setting and you've got a lock system of some sort, you have a lock system of some sort for the old world monkeys and then you come to the capuchin cage and it's got padlocks everywhere because if there's something that's operating on a little spring, they'll undo it. They will figure that out. So, so they are like orangutans in that respect. The orangutans disassemble their cages. Well, uh, capuchins don't disassemble their cages. They're usually not strong enough, but they will, they will move every moving part. And if there's a latch, they will undo it unless it's fixed. So they have to have a more reinforced kind of cage. Th there's, there's many examples. Like they are, they are creative. They are generative in their manipulation. They take this rather large repertoire of actions and they apply them in every combination to every object and surface they have. And in captivity, they just have endless time to do this. In the wild, they're busy foraging and they're doing less that you would uh, identify. But we identify it as creative in captivity because it's their unnatural materials and unnatural
context. So you have to look in a different way in a natural setting. Okay, so here's the scoop. We have we can we actually have time for a break until 11:30, and then we're going to be back here sharp at 11:30. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.